We now come to debate um, on e petition 329, 339, and 332789 about support for live events and weddings during COVID 19. Eric Colburn to move the motion. Uh, I beg to move that this House is considered e petition 329339 relating to the number of guests permitting at, permitted at weddings during the coronavirus pandemic and e petition 332789 relating to support for nightclubs, festivals, and the live events industry. Uh, Mr. Gray, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and can I thank all honourable and right honourable members for a, a full Westminster Hall debate on this petitions committee debate this afternoon. Uh, if I can turn first to the petition on weddings, uh, this is particularly important to me because I myself have had to postpone my wedding that I was supposed to have uh, in July. <laughs> Um, but uh, before I go on to lament about that, uh, I think it's important to know exactly what we're debating uh, this afternoon. Um, this over 110,000 people so far have signed this petition, including 150 of my own constituents in Carshalton and Wallington, and the prayer of the petition states the following. Weddings take months, even years of intricate planning. Myself and a number of others believe that the maximum number of guests authorised at wedding ceremonies should be increased. The number of guests permitted should be calculated according to venue capacity. For instance, if a venue has a capacity of 600 people, social distancing could still be practiced with a fifth of this number. People should not have to alter their plans if social distancing is observed. Surely if beaches are allowed to remain open, weddings should be permitted to go ahead considering appropriate measures are put in place. It is more, apparent, uh, it is more than apparent that social distancing is not practiced at such public places, thus guidelines for weddings should be reconsidered. Now, at present, as the government outlined in their response, before we entered into a second national lockdown, weddings could take place, but numbers were restricted to 15 or 30 people. Now, once again, sadly, weddings are restricted to deathbed weddings alone. But I would like to um, pick up something with the Minister, that, that I have heard some rather worrying testimony from Professor Sandberg from, Car from Cardiff University, who has pointed out to me that apparently across the country there has been varying interpretation of this guidance, with some areas insisting that deathbed weddings can only take place in a hospital setting which has denied some couples the, um, the ability to tie the knot in really tragic circumstances. So I'd be glad if the minister could take that away and pick that up. Uh, now, I understand uh, some of the arguments that have been made. Some have been directed at me after my own wedding got cancelled, that two people, even two people who are in love shouldn't need a big event uh, to get married, that they can have smaller ceremonies now and leave a big party until later, and that people will always need uh, to get married and therefore the wedding events industry will survive. Uh, but I think these arguments fail to acknowledge a few key difficulties, uh, such as the planning involved in putting a wedding on, uh, the wider effect that it has on the industry and indeed some of the traditions that are associated with weddings. And this last point can be demonstrated by the petitioner herself, Zaina Ali, who tells her story. She states that my brother was due to get married in August and coming from an Asian Pakistani background, we had planned this big wedding and, and had been doing so for well over a year. It is with great sadness, anger and every other relating emotion I, get it, I guess what made it even more emotional was the fact that my brother's wife had, had lost her dad to cancer when she was a baby. The fact that her father couldn't be there for her big day was heartbreaking enough, but the fact that my grandparents couldn't give her away in true Pakistani style made it that much harder. They felt like they had almost failed her father. There were also a few personal reasons as to why we did not want to postpone the wedding, and I'm sure many are in the same situation. And I can confirm that many indeed are. My own wedding uh, was due to the number of guests we'd hoped to have had to be postponed. Uh, like many others, we had planned for over two years, actually. And by postponing, this didn't just have an effect on us. It also had an effect on the caterers, the florists, the decorators, entertainment, marquee companies, and everyone else involved in putting a wedding on. Uh, and I've spoken to some local businesses uh, like the Function Junction in Wallington uh, who supply things like decorations for weddings and live events uh, who tell me that while some people like myself have decided to postpone and use their same supplier, many, due to the uncertainty of that the coronavirus pandemic has brought, have decided to instead just to cancel altogether and not set a new date. That's both leaving the couple devastated but also leaving businesses out of pocket. And now, according to research, the industry, in, industry has already lost most of its planned weddings for the first quarter for 2021 and are facing pressures on the second. If there's no commitment before July, the sector tells me that they will lose most of its revenue uh, up to June 2021 or beyond and even run the risk of collapsing fully. Therefore, my ask would be that the government looks carefully at liberalising the restrictions around uh, weddings once we come out of this second national lockdown and additionally set out a roadmap for reopening the wedding industry in the longer term. 
Now, we hope and pray that a vaccine will allow weddings to take place normally again sometime soon, and indeed we've had some good news today. But we must also have a plan B for living longer term with the virus. Therefore, I would argue, like the petitioners, that this could begin after lockdown by amending guidance on weddings to allow for greater guest capacity based on the venue. Many countries in Europe, for example, have permitted weddings in, with socially distanced numbers, some capped at, say, 100, in the equivalent of what would be our tier one or lower environments. And even here in the UK, Northern Ireland has operated socially distanced weddings since June, uh, until the more recent restrictions were brought in. They were granted parity with hospitality, and there are no known outbreaks um, associated with weddings in Northern Ireland. So I think this example does prove that it can work. Uh, but also in the longer term, weddings to me seem like the perfect place to trial rapid testing, because... Yeah. Given the planning involved, they're relatively easy to share details prior to the event, conduct testing on arrival if necessary, and indeed test and trace after the event has taken place. So I hope that that will also be considered as a potential um, pilot um, for rapid testing. Now, I've spoken about the impact of the pandemic on the industry, and further restrictions and uncertainty will only cause further damage. So a commitment to socially distanced weddings, to rapid testing trials, and equitable support for the wedding industry with other hospitality businesses will help to deliver a bounce back for this industry. Now, if I can turn to the e-petition on live events. Uh, to date, just over 145,000 people have signed this petition, uh, including 236 from my own Coshal and Wallington constituency. And the prayer of this petition states that the government has failed to provide significant support to UK festivals, dance venues, and nightclubs. COVID-19 has hit hard on the nightlife sector, having had a major impact due to the suspension of mass gatherings. Followed by unclear guidelines and a lack of commitment, this has contributed to growing uncertainty within the arts sector and put millions of jobs at risk. The government must make clear its commitment to ensuring the dance community survives the pandemic. Hashtag let us dance. Now, in preparing for this debate, I'm extremely grateful to the lead petitioners, Jasper and Anthony, uh, as well as the Nighttime Industries Association, for taking the time to share their concerns uh, with me and explain the issues that the sector are facing in a bit more detail. And the figures are quite stark. The nighttime economy is the UK's fifth largest sector. It contributes £66 billion per year to the economy, which is 6% of the UK total, and provides in the region of 1.3 million jobs alongside an entire supply line of creative freelancers, sole traders, and skilled technicians. And significant parts of this sector, unlike other hospitality businesses, have not been able to open at all since um, lockdown in March, particularly nightclubs I'm thinking of in this example. Now, some venues have indeed invested heavily in becoming COVID secure or even repurposed. Uh, however, even those venues have only been able to trade at a fraction of the capacity that they were able to before. Uh, and also, many have raised concerns about the implementation of the arbitrary 10 p.m. curfew. Uh, now, we are facing another national lockdown and the uncertainty is growing. And uh, indeed, there is calls from the sector for an urgent set of sector-specific support packages. Now, prior to the new national lockdown, there was a survey commissioned by the Nighttime Industries Association uh, and their members, and there were some pretty devastating statistics out, coming out of that survey. 72% of businesses said that they were unable to open or trade. 58 feared that they would not survive longer than two months after a job retention scheme came to an end. 71% said that they were set to make more than half of their workforce redundant. Just a third said that they were able to repurpose. The average cost of repurposing was anywhere between 10 and 30,000 pounds. And 84% of businesses were only achieving 10 to 50% of their normal trade. And as I said, this was, all, this, this was on, on top of growing concerns about the implementation of a 10 p.m. curfew. Uh, it was seen that the nighttime economy, uh, for many, uh, was the target of restrictions, uh, despite PHE evidence indicating that infection transmissions in hospitality was only around 4%. The danger was that the curfew could drive people to congregate in the streets and in mass gatherings outside, or even continue their night um, in unsafe, unregulated and illegal gatherings behind closed doors. And I've spoken to hospitality businesses in Carshawton and Wallington who've expressed similar concerns to me. Uh, popular local businesses like the Ginger Italian and the Duke's Head and others uh, thankfully have had their loyal customers come back to them once hospitality was allowed to partially reopen. Uh, but it was felt that the 10pm curfew was really stunting their ability to be able to recover. Uh, there have also been further concerns about the allocation of support grants and packages, uh, as there were fears that the contemporary dance music scene uh, was not uh, take, properly taken into account properly when it came to funding allocations by the Arts Council. 
Uh, now, nighttime businesses and their supply chains, I think it's fair to say, have recognised that they need to put public health first. And they've worked incredibly hard to make themselves COVID safe for when that happens. But they do need clarity in the form of a roadmap to reopening so that they can prepare financially for this to happen. And then in terms of their finances, the NTIA has got a number of asks. This includes employment support guaranteeing 80% of wages to continue, an extension of the self-employed income support scheme, a sector-specific grant system proportionate to the operating costs of frontline businesses and the supply chain, a workable commercial rent solution, a reduced rate of VAT for hospitality throughout 2021, and a business rates holiday for 21-22, and ultimately that all-important exit strategy from lockdown. Now, there are fears amongst the industry that without these measures, we do risk losing our nightlife and indeed our cultural heritage for good. So again, whilst I say that the news today is good and we do hope that a vaccine might be fast coming to allow some semblance of normality to come back again. We do have to have a plan for both of these sectors to live with the virus. Repeated lockdowns, as the government itself has said, are not the answer and further restrictions could well mean that the industry is not there to recover at the end. So in both of these cases, I would urge the government to look carefully at the concerns raised by the industry. Look at the support that could be made available in the short term, but most importantly, both for weddings and for live events, set out that clear roadmap for reopening so that these businesses can begin to bounce.